When I first moved off grid, I didn't know that's what it was called. It just felt right to me at the time. And now I reckon everybody ought to realise they've got the option to go off grid. It doesn't mean they have to or they should, but I just like people to know that they could. For me, it's about reducing my consumption and about being free. And it's a way of just unplugging from the system, of treating the earth a little bit better, reducing your own power consumption and water consumption. So there's room in this society without any real strain for maybe up to a million people to go off grid. Hugh Piggott is one of the founding fathers of the wind power movement in Britain. His lessons in how to build your own wind turbine are legendary on the internet. I'm a very ordinary person really who likes playing with windmills. There's something inherently difficult and troublesome about the wind. It's a mischievous source of energy. So you've got to love it really in order to work with it and, and to live with it. it. It's not an easy road, but, um, but it's very, very satisfying. As a child, I spent a lot of time on the West Coast where we had a wonderful fairy tale existence and with my cousin we went in search of a place where we could spend some time that would be remote from the road and, and electricity and, and we happened upon this place and were invited to stay a bit longer and so sort of took it from there. The air is washed clean and when the sun does come out, the colours are fantastic, they're sparkling. The hills and the sea make a magic combination that, that sort of work in harmony and it's hard to imagine how you would live somewhere where you didn't have a view of the hills and the world breathing. The reason that I came here was to get back to the land and grow vegetables and, and keep animals and stuff. So I think a, a lot of the satisfaction is the sort of wholeness of actually experiencing you know, planting the seeds and, and hoeing the vegetables and, and eating the end product or a simpler life, recycling more, reusing things that other people had thrown away. I used to go to the dump in Inverness and that seemed to me at the time and still does to be a fairly worthwhile thing, although my life's changed a lot since then. Well, even if you don't believe that there's going to be a crash, that society may collapse, that global warming may cause huge energy shortages and food shortages. You have to accept it's a possibility. While governments and corporations are busily taking the credit for environmental actions, it's people who are living off-grid who are really showing the rest of us the way. Wind is abundant, free clean and initially when I first started using wind energy all I wanted was light you know a few 12 volt bulbs fantastic you know that was the most wonderful thing in the world what we found as we got bigger windmills and became more consumerist and started wanting to have a fridge washing machine etc you become a hostage to your consumer habits and I spent a year actually unsuccessfully trying about nine different prototypes of all different sorts his early wind turbine designs were based on the idea that you could make them from just available materials, whatever was around, scrap even. I was successful with a very, very small bicycle dynamo machine, but that wasn't really going to provide a significant amount of power. So I tried all sorts of car, dynam car alternators and, uh, and so on, and, and ended up with a, a bus dynamo which worked reasonably well. But I discovered that really the, the best solution was along the lines of what Bev had discovered, the, the dynamos from the Austin Champ Jeep. Well, I've always found wind power attractive in the same way that collecting old bits of furniture off the tip in Inverness was attractive because it's free. And so for about 10 years, I, I made and sold um, small wind turbines of that sort for battery charging on Scorig and a few elsewhere. Scorig's really a shining example of an off-grid community. Every household is self-contained. They all have their own power supply. I think it's gone up from about five to about 80 people in the last 40 years. It appeals to people who, not so much people who want to join a, a commune or whatever, as, as people who want to have a, a space where they can explore their own individualism. You're much more in touch with, with the elements. The wind determines your daily rhythm, what you're going to be doing, whether you're going to be washing, running the washing machine, or hoovering, or using the computer, or work outside instead. I think these windmills are they're beautiful, they're aesthetically pleasing, you know. They are, they have character, they're really nice you know, in, in, in the landscape. It seems to work very well, but for me personally, it wouldn't work very well if we didn't have Hugh Pickett living here as well, who's you know, prepared to 
maintain these windmills. I started out trying to make my own electricity and ended up making electricity for everybody else and then moving from that to telling people how to make their own electricity. It's much more of a challenge than I thought it was going to be when I started. One assumes that the wind blows and you generate electricity and, and that that's the, the process is relatively simple, but in actual fact the wind is a very fickle medium so that the wind in itself is a source of intense frustration and also delight when you actually manage to harness it. When you fight against something and fail and keep on fighting up, what I find is that I, I got obsessed really with the subject and, and um, I'm fascinated by it. People who come on a build-your-own-windmill course hoping to learn um, a tried-and-tested design, unfortunately, um, what they're going to be getting is what I think is the best, and that's not necessarily going to be what I was teaching last year. It is a constant experiment, and that's what makes life so exciting. We've got uh, Dell from Birmingham. Uh, we've got Lyle from the Shetland Islands, uh, James from Cornwall. We've got uh, Paul from Castle, Germany, uh, myself from Chicago, Zoltan from Hungary. And then we've also got Stelios from Greece. This, this one you had to put it on at 50 centimeters, wasn't it? Yeah. The basic raw materials are the blades, which are made of wood. The frame of the machine is welded steel, so there's a little bit of welding required. And then the electrical side of it requires permanent magnets. The whole machine added together might be in the region of 300 pounds if you were buying it just uh, you know, in, in small quantities. Is actually probably not as big a consideration as the amount of time that would go into fabricating it. So it's about a month's work for a person, basically, if you're a beginner. You would still then need to look at erecting it on a tower and uh, buying any batteries or inverters. It's a relatively small machine, but suitable for domestic use on Skorig. You'd probably be using it for lighting, computer use, a bit of television, a bit of this and that. The windmill should be shorted. And we can hoist it up and uh, get it into action. Just seeing something that produced electricity from your own hands is really satisfying. <laughs> <laughs>